Good afternoon. Hello, hello. Welcome. Um, we've got a, a few folks coming on in, which is good. Um, welcome to Strength for Today, Bright Hope for Tomorrow, uh, Millennial Clergy in the Postmodern World. My name is Danny Quanstrom. I am the lead pastor at Hastings Church of the Nazarene in Hastings, Michigan. And now I can do this. So if you know anything about Michigan, here I am. Um, <laughs> Been in my been in that office for five months now, learning what it means to be a pastor, and boy, it's a whole lot of fun, a uh, whole lot of work, but a lot of fun. Well, thank you for being here today. Um, I really believe in the work that uh, has been done. I really believe in the project, and I'm excited to share uh, kind of what I've been working on. And uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, everyone, can you guys hear me? All right, all right, good. Uh, well. As a beginning, this presentation is obviously about millennial pastors. This whole project that I'll be presenting started nearly a year ago uh, when it became very apparent that many millennial pastors were leaving the denomination. Uh, it came to my attention, I had a whole lot of friends that were leaving the church, and it really bugged me, it really hurt. Um, I had many who had left, and I had many who were on the brink of leaving, and so a few of us started, we started talking about some of the issues that cause young Nazarene clergy to leave. Um, and I'll leave that for later in the presentation. But out of these conversations and out of conversations with my older brother, who's also a millennial pastor, uh, we were talking about how frustrated we were that everybody was talking about those millennials, you know? Uh, you know, those millennials. And, and I realized that there wasn't any research on millennials by millennials. There's nothing I could find. Um, I was trying to find data conducted by younger researchers about us, but it wasn't there. Um, it seemed to me that everyone was making this huge deal about that millennial generation. Tons of research and tons of books were being published about us, but it was all being done by non-millennials. Uh, and it seemed to me that everybody was talking about us but no one was talking with us. Uh, we didn't have a voice in saying who we were to be. Uh, it also became apparent that there wasn't any research about millennial clergy at all. There wasn't anything that I could find about pastors of this millennial generation. Uh, and so out of all of this, I decided to put together a survey for millennial clergy by millennial clergy specific to Nazarenes. And I started, I started putting the survey together, and I asked quite a few friends for their input. Um, and I wish he could be here, but my brother Ryan really helped me out. Uh, ben Kramer, one of my good friends, really helped me out. Uh, Stephanie Lobdell and Kara Shoneman, I want to thank them for helping review the work and for submitting questions. And I asked for their help specifically because I wanted to curb male bias. Uh, I wanted the survey to be done by both women and men of the millennial generation, and so I wanted their input, and so they helped out a lot. And so once composed, I sent the survey out, I distributed it on social media and got very minimal response, which was kind of to be expected. Um, and so then, uh, yeah, it, word got around, and I was at First Church at the time, and the general secretary, David Wilson, uh, I was talking to him at a barbecue, and. And he said, hey, you need to send this uh, to the GMC. Uh, you need to talk to Dan Kopp at, uh, in clergy development. And so I said, okay. And so I got his contact information and, and got in touch with him. And he said, yes, this is something we want to do. Um, he said, but uh, you need my approval, really, for research to do anything with this, because not everybody who puts together a survey can have the Global Ministry Center just distribute their stuff. He said, but I want to do it. Let me talk to Rich Housel. So Rich and Dan were vital in getting this done. Um, and so I was, I was really thankful for that. Rich added some tweaks, uh, being in the research set center. Um, and then he distributed the survey to all clergy uh, with at least a district license born after 1980. So that is who this, the survey surveys. Millennial pastors born after 1980 uh, with at least a district license. And I want to I wanna give, a thank, give some special thanks to some other people. Once I composed the survey, um, I sent it to a few different professors and scholars for some review, one being my dad, who's a professor at Olivet, for some theological tweaking. And I asked Dr. Benefiel out at Point Loma, a sociologist, 
I said, hey, you're, you're a sociologist. Would you look at this? Let me know what you think. Help remove bias. Help, uh, help make this a better survey than it is. And so I want to I wanna give thanks to them. Um, and I'm, I was glad to have some professional uh, input so that it wasn't just some random 27-year-old put together this survey and then it's credible. Uh, but I really was trying to get those who, who know what they're talking about. So what is the survey? Um, of the roughly 1,100 clergy in the U.S. and Canada uh, born, born after 1980, um, there are 1,133 surveys distributed, 522 responded, and of those, 418 completed fully the entire survey. Um, this was a larger response rate than I had anticipated. Uh, I thought, yeah, it'll, get a, good, it'll good, get a good response rate, but I was blown away. Uh, and this indicated to me that millennial clergy really want their voice to be heard. Young pastors want a place to talk about these things. Uh, and so this presentation is really an attempt to give voice to my generation of Nazarene clergy. Uh, my hope is that this is not what I think, but that I'm able to say what the survey has said. And I do believe that the results of this survey give a very good general understanding of my generation's perspective. Uh, and so after the initial survey, Rich Halsa thought it would be good to conduct a similar survey uh, of non-millennial clergy as a control. Uh, it's wanting to know, is there really anything different among millennial clergy? Is there anything that millennials think differently? And so we put together a control survey. Um, and there were, uh, it was distributed to non-millennials, basically anyone born before 1980. We distributed 500 as a control. There were 155 responses and 131 of those completed the response. Um, so the survey was composed of, of three main sections. Uh, after gathering general demographic data, there was a theological section, a section on polity, Theology, polity, and then leadership. And it had 61 questions, and then there were a bunch of miscellaneous questions and write-in responses. Uh, if you want a full list of, the, of that, uh, you can go to dquanstrom.wordpress.com. That'll be up, up on it again at the end of the presentation. But uh, that has a full list of all the questions. Uh, so it's going to follow these three main sections, theology, polity, and leadership, um, also including some of the miscellaneous information and some of the write-in data, I have some of the responses. And we're not, going to be look, we're not going to be able to look at everything going on in here because I have an hour. Um, so, the question of the day. Uh, why should millennial clergy, why should pastors born after 1980 be strength for today and hope for tomorrow? Uh, there are a couple different reasons and... When I looked at the data, there are a few things that really should give you great hope about us. And one of the first things I noticed was the amount of millennials with theological education. We're educated. We are an educated generation of clergy. Um, so here is, here is the data from the, from the presentation, uh, from the survey. 37% of millennials have completed a graduate degree in formal theological education. And this is including those who have at least started or completed doctoral work. So over one third, 37%. 60% uh, of all millennial clergy have at least started a master's degree. 60% have at least begun graduate work. Uh, while 86% have a bachelor's degree in formal theological education. 86% of all pastors born after 1980 have, have completed a bachelor's degree in theological studies. When you compare that to non-millennials, this is their information. 52% of them have completed a graduate degree in formal theological education. That is including those who have completed doctoral work. And honestly, this I was expected to see this differential. I expected to see that more non-millennials have completed a graduate degree. Um, they've been in the church longer. I would expect there to be higher numbers. Um, but then the, then the numbers get interesting. Uh, if you add up those who have at least started a master's, the numbers are virtually the same. Uh, 59% uh, and some change of millennials have started a master's, and for non-millennials, 59% and some change have as well. Plus, when you take out the doctoral studies, uh, when you take that out, the, difference, the differences diminish in a lot of ways. Uh, the difference is, though, that millennials are 
I, the millennials, I think, are more inclined to finish the studies they've not yet completed because many who took the survey are currently enrolled in programs. Many who did the work are currently studying, or we would be more inclined, because we're younger, to then go and pursue more education. Um, and then when you look at those who have completed a bachelor's degree, what's really interesting is more percentage-wise, more millennials than non-millennials have completed a bachelor's degree in formal theological education. Uh, we saw that 86% of millennials have completed a bachelor's degree in theology, but, but only 75% of non-millennials have completed a bachelor's degree. Uh, and you see the big difference there in the, towards the very bottom, the ordination course of study. Um, it's over 20% of non-millennials where their formal theological education is the ordination course of study when it's about 4% of millennials where that has been their only formal theological education. Um, so we are an educated uh, group. Uh, education is not without its issues, though, and we're going to look at that later. Uh, while we need to have more, I think we need more theologically trained clergy, uh, and I think we need more pastors with graduate degrees, uh, I think it's encouraging that millennials value theological education. We believe in being an educated people. And I think that should be really good because we really do believe in that. Um, so we're educated. Why are we hope? We're educated. The other thing is we love our theology. We really do. Uh, not disconnected from education. We love our theology. And that is we love Nazarene theology. It might be expected that this number is smaller than non-millennials, and it is. It's 92% of non-millennials who are in full agreement with the Articles of Faith. And an 8% difference is not insignificant. I don't want to diminish that. Um, but I think many people think millennials don't agree with Nazarene doctrine. I think there's this perception that millennials have these weird views and they don't agree with Nazarene theology, but that's not the case. Overwhelmingly, we love Nazarene doctrine. Not only that, but we believe that there is coherence within Nazarene doctrine. For millennials, 79% either agree or strongly agree that our theology is coherent. That is, that it works together. It is an integrated theology. Uh, for non-millennials, it's 84% who either strongly agree or agree that our theology is coherent. For both, either disagree or strongly disagree, it's 9%. 9% of both millennials and non-millennials disagree with a coherence in our doctrine. Uh, so that number is the exact same. Um, we believe in holiness. Regarding our theology, we do believe in holiness. I think some people are afraid that we're going to lose something with the millennial generation regarding holiness. Um, for millennials, 69% either agree strongly or agree with how the manual discusses the doctrine of entire sanctification. And honestly, this was a shock to me. I was blown away that over two-thirds agreed with the manual's stance on entire sanctification. Um, and you'll see why in a little bit. Um, I, I didn't think it would be over two-thirds. Then when you look at non-millennials, 83% either agree or strongly agree. And the truth is, this is a large disparity. Um, but I was blown away by how many millennials actually agree. And part of the reason I was blown away is because of many of the comments talked about how the wording is limiting or the wording is outdated. And so I've got some of the comments that people said, I think the manual could be, could be more clear. I think the language could be updated. Uh, I said agree, but I would say the article of faith is old-fashioned in language and practice. While I agree with the doctrine itself, I feel we could definitely rewrite it to make it more easily understood for all. I believe the manual is not very understandable in its explanation on this topic, and it needs rewritten in order to be understood and realized in the church. This I, I took four of hundreds of responses as indicative of what so many people were saying over and over and over again. Uh, we don't disagree with the article in essence. We have issues with the particular language. Um, we believe it needs to be updated. We, need, we believe it needs to be reinterpreted for a postmodern world. It needs to be uh, contextualized. It needs to be made appropriate for our world today. Um, and it's also interesting to note, uh, I don't have anything on this, but one of the questions was, um, 
I believe there is a coherent understanding of entire sanctification among pastors in the Church of the Nazarene. For non-millennials and millennials alike, that was overwhelmingly no, that there is not a coherent understanding of entire sanctification in the denomination. Uh, and that, that became glaringly apparent. So we love our theology. We love holiness. And we, we think eschatology is essential. We really do. So the question was, I believe eschatology is an essential Christian doctrine necessary to our understanding of soteriology and ecclesiology. For millennials, 76% either agree or strongly agree that yes, eschatology is essential. It's so important. Compare that to non-millennials. 65% agree or strongly agree. Is eschatology important? 11% of millennial, 11% more millennials said yes. Eschatology is essential to our understanding of salvation in the church. Uh, and this is one of the biggest disparities we've seen, one of them so far in the survey. Uh, And to me, this indicates an integrated theology. Uh, This indicates that we don't think our theology can be compartmentalized. It can't be segmented or bifurcated. Uh, Our generation believes that our different eschatology, soteriology, ecclesiology, pneumatology, whatever, these are integrated. These, you cannot pull one out without it affecting the whole. Um, But what is really striking about this is, is how our esch- what our eschatological views are and how they break down. Uh, so question, the next question I had was, uh, I would best identify with five different categories. Uh, dispensational premillennialism, classic premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism, or I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> you see the data there. Um, 51% of millennials said, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, And most of the comments that happened in response to this question was, I reject the whole millennial language. I don't don't even want to talk about millennial. Um, So then you look at non-millennials, and 43% said, I'm not sure, with very similar comments. Um, And as I analyzed the data, I would lump nearly every single one of these I'm not sure's, practically all of them, I would lump them into the amillennialist category. Because all amillennialism is, is that uh, it's, a re- it's a rejection of the notion of a literal thousand years. So we would say, amillennial, I, in my interpretation, it's like 80% per, 80 of millennials would qualify as amillennialist, that I don't believe in a literal thousand year reign. Um, the millennium is kind of whatever. I believe in eschatology, not in this whole rapture stuff. Um, and then 11% are, are post-millennial. Uh, what is often, often considered the historic Nazarene position, dis- depending on which kind of school you went to and which tradition within our little tribe you were, post-millennialism was kind of one of the foundations, as many have put it. Um, but when you get to the pre-millennialism, things get really interesting. Uh, 6.5% of millennials would say that they have classic pre-millennialism, while 19% of non-millennials would say they, they believe in classic premillennialism. So one out of five non-millennial pastors believe in a classic premillennialism, and then dispensational premillennialism, which would be that one category that makes up rapture. Um, 2.5 millennials would agree with that, while 9% percent of nons would agree with that. So nearly one in 10 non-millennial pastors believe in a rapture. Um, and that number doubles uh, with it's, that number doubles up to 20 percent when you, when you pull out just those who have gone through the ordination course of study. If you've only done the ordination course of study, you're twice as likely to believe in a rapture eschatology. Um, and so then when you So then, we love our theology, we love eschatology, we love holiness. We think eschatology is essential. We really do. Um, And the other thing is, we believe in female clergy. Look at this. I'm in agreement with the Church of the Nazarene's affirmation of women in ministry that it is incompatible with the character of God presented throughout Scripture to prohibit women from any and all pastoral positions. 95% 95% agree with the Nazarene position that women can be clergy. And of those 95%, 79% strongly agree, uh, while only 3% of millennial clergy disagree. Uh, less than 1% strongly disagree with our stance. 
Uh, for non-millennials, 87% agree with female clergy. There's not a huge disparity here, but 54% strongly agree, while 79% of millennials strongly agree. So there's a 25% difference. And for non-millennials, 9% disagree. Um, a 25% a 25 differential for those who strongly agree, to me, is huge. It's not just that, yeah, we affirm it, but no, we believe in it. We think it should be the case that women have every, every gift and grace available to them to be any position in the denomination. Uh, and millennials, we really do agree with that. Uh, we also believe in creation care. Uh, for millennials, 93% uh, agree with the manual's position, and only 3% disagree. Um, and then for non-millennials, you look at this, and it's very similar. 94% uh, agree with less than 2% disagreeing. It seems like we really do believe in it, but there was something interesting when I looked at the comment section of this question. Uh, here's what some people said. I agree with the stance, but feel that it's something that we have, have in writing, but do not address otherwise. This is millennial responses, saying, yeah, I agree with what we say, but what does it mean? I think we could take a stronger stance. It's in our manual, and yet our policies and our actions do not support that. We are destroying the earth, not stewarding it. Uh, however, our stewardship is more than preservation, it is cultivation. Uh, so saying we could have stronger language, we could say more about creation care, it could be something that we practice in deed, not only in word. Uh, over and over again, people said, yeah, I agree with the position, but I don't believe the language is strong enough. Uh, we believe we ought to have more creation care, not just, uh, not just preservation, but cultivation, taking care of the earth, as was originally stated in when, when man entered the earth, when God created us and said, take care of the earth, have dominion over the earth. And as Christians, we read dominion through the lens of Christ, to the, Christ the King, whose dominion was that of service. Uh, how do we take care of the earth? The way that Christ loved us, by giving himself to it. That's the type of dominion we practice. And so, why should millennial clergy be strength for today and hope for tomorrow? We're educated. We love our theology. And this next one, I think, is the biggest. We love our church. We love our church. It, this question falls under the, under the category of theology. I believe it's worth its, worth its own titles. Uh, the question regarding the church was... Um, I believe that participation in the local church is necessary for salvation. And when you look at this, you might think, well, okay, um, that's interesting. For millennials, barely over 40% agree with the statement. And barely over 40% disagree. While 20% neither agree nor disagree. So 40%, roughly 4 out of 10, say yeah. Uh, but then what's interesting is you look at the non-millennials. 26% agree with that, and 54% disagree with it, while 20%, again, neither agree nor disagree. Uh, there are a few things I want to take away from this one right here. Um, one is in regards to soteriology. Uh, in, in the comments, many people said, yeah, one should participate in the church, but at times it isn't possible. Uh, or that God might save someone who is repentant on their deathbed, or if you're on an island, whatever, and you have no church to go to. And I thought, <laughs> okay, come on. Um, so, so there were many outliers in the comment section, uh, but the comments begged the question, really, what is salvation? Soteriology, what is that? Um, and maybe that's something we need to address in, in the denomination a bit further. Uh, I'm really excited to see when Dr. Noble's Church Dogmatics comes out, uh, if and when it does, in its presentation of soteriology. I think that will be really important. Uh, and I'm biased, so take this with a grain of salt. But I would recommend From Grace to Grace as a very, very good resource regarding Wesleyan soteriology for clergy. I'm biased on that. Um, if you don't know why, it's because my dad wrote the book. Um, um, but uh, another thing is there were those who, who believed the word necessary was too strong. Um, perhaps, perhaps that wasn't the best word to use. Um, I want to recognize my own limitations. If There are some things I would like to redo with the survey. If I could do it over, I would change a few things. 
much like every sermon I preach every Sunday. Um, but perhaps necessary wasn't the right word to use. Maybe if I did it again, uh, if, I, if I would do that, I would change the word to essential uh, rather than necessary. Uh, so I want to recognize that, that I probably could have worded that a little bit better. Um, but the other thing we need to look at is Nazarene ecclesiology. Uh, what is a Nazarene doctrine of the church? Um, there seems to be this nagging question in the denomination on what the church is. What is the church? I don't know that we have fully a well-organized or a well-articulated ecclesiology. If you know of one, please let me know. Um, and I think Dr. LeClaire, uh, was it with, Ben, was it with Maddox that Maddox and LeClaire just published, published an ecclesiology? I've not yet read that. I want to. Um, but I don't know that we have a form of well-articulated ecclesiology, and perhaps this question highlights that, both for non-millennials and for millennials. Um, but we can see that millennials don't just love the church. We love the church of the Nazarene. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm blown away that there was a 14% disparity on this. Um, this is huge to me. Uh, I gotta hold on a second. Okay, I'm gonna move on and then I'm gonna come back to that. Um, so some of the comments under that question. Um, my answer is rooted in the idea that salvation isn't simply about going to heaven, but about life in Christ. For life in Christ, we need the community of believers. Yes, we need to be in the church. Uh, one must learn to serve and love, hallmarks of the sanctified heart. I don't see this happen in such a profound and mysterious way except within the church family. Uh, we believe that you should be in the church. Four out of ten millennials say yes. I do not think it is necessary for salvation, but I do believe it is necessary for spiritual growth. Again, the word necessary was important there. Um, so necessary, well, yeah. Um, essential, maybe. So that's something I would like to tweak if I ever did it again. But here's the thing. We don't just love the church. We love our church. We love being Nazarenes. I pay attention in person online to the delegations regarding Nazarene polity at General Assembly. 69% said yes. 16, over two-thirds of millennial pastors are paying attention to what happens on the General Assembly floor. At the last General Assembly, I was a student at NTS, and I cannot tell you how many of us were in class. Are there any professors here? Um, <laughs> we were in class with the delegations up on our computers. We wanted to pay attention to what was going on. We want to know what's happening in our church. We believe we are affected by this. We love our church. I pay attention in person online to the delegations regarding Nazarene polity at General Assembly for non-millennials. 69%. We, we pay as much attention to General Assembly as non-millennials. There's this notion that we're disengaged and lazy. We care about our church. We love our church. We believe the Church of the Nazarene is ours. Uh, and while there, are, while there are a lot of takeaways from, from these questions, uh, I could dwell on this for a long time. I think there's one thing in particular that should be strength for today and particularly hope for tomorrow, is that 14% more millennials believe the church is necessary. More millennials than non-millennials think the church is necessary. Uh, to me, that's huge. I was blown away that those who have been in the pulpit the least amount of time have a higher regard for the church. I don't know, maybe, maybe a bunch of non-millennials are burnt out or hurt, but man, I expected that those who were older would say it was more essential. I expected that, I expected that non-millennials would have a higher regard for the church. And I believe, I believe that statistic blows away perceptions of millennials. It seems to me that everyone thinks the church is going to die with millennials. Uh, perhaps the modern enlightened iteration of the church will end. Perhaps that particular model might end. But the reality is that we really do love the church. We believe in the church. Um, my data reveals that more than generations prior, we believe the church to be the great hope for the world. We, drew, we truly believe in the church. Um, 
In my opinion, uh, it is my opinion that all of the data uh, was lower than it probably should have been. And perhaps that was my error by putting in the word necessary rather than essential. Revealing my own hand, I think I wished that the data for both millennials and non-millennials was higher. That yes, the church, that more than four out of ten millennials would say yes. Uh, the historic theological position is that there is no salvation outside of the church. Uh, you get that throughout history, that being a Christian is being involved in the life of the church, whatever that iteration might be, whatever that means. But we see an increase in younger clergy regarding the role that the church plays in the world. We think more than the generations prior that the church should have a greater position in our world. And, and we see this play out practically. Uh, the millennial generation of clergy is something to be excited about. I truly believe it is. Look forward to the days that are coming. Uh, but we're facing an issue in the denomination. Um, we're losing really good millennial clergy. Uh, we are. Uh, perhaps this happens in every generation. Um, I don't know, but I think there's a qualitative difference among millennials. Uh, there was a question... Uh, well, so hold on. Uh, we're educated. We love our theology. We love the church. This is incredibly good. Um, there is a question, have you ever seriously considered leaving the church in the Nazarene? Uh, both both non-millennials and millennials said 37% said yes. Um, those who have been in it for life, 37% said yes, I have seriously considered leaving the denomination. They were exactly the same. Uh, but the trend among generations is that the younger you are, the more likely you are to have considered leaving. Uh, the generation that has considered leaving the most is Gen Xers at 45%. Uh, nearly half of the Gen Xers have seriously considered leaving the denomination. Um, and it's 30, 37% of millennials. And millennials were 35 and under, uh, according to this. And so to have that be so high, um, I don't know, that's, that's an issue. And while this happens in every generation, I believe we need to be active about keeping millennial clergy in the Church of the Nazarene. Uh, I, in conversations with other non-millennials, it became apparent to me that many in the past who left the pulpit did so uh, in order to do parachurch uh, things. They would leave the church and they would do inner city mission. They would leave the church and start a church camp. They would leave the church and do this or that. But you don't see that among millennials. You don't see them starting as many parachurch things. When millennials leave the denomination, they go to other denominations. They don't leave the pulpit. They leave the denomination. Uh, they still want to pastor. They want to stay in the church. They continue to preach. And oftentimes, they preach in places that will let them. They still believe in the church, but oftentimes they don't know that the Church of the Nazarene believes in them. So, millennial clergy really should give Nazarene leaders and other Nazarene pastors uh, both strength and hope. We're educated, we love our theology, and we love our church. We love our church. But, uh, there are some issues surrounding millennial clergy. Uh, We've begun to address it. Uh, millennial clergy are leaving, and one of the big questions is why. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's a neat and tidy answer to this question. Why are young pastors leaving? I don't think there's, I, I can't narrow that down to like one thing. Um, we're all persons. We all have a story. We all have a different reason uh, for why we might have left. Um, but the data shows that 37% of millennials have seriously considered leaving. Have you ever seriously considered leaving the Church of the Nazarene to serve as clergy elsewhere? Yes, 37%. Um, the same statistic, as I said, applies to non-millennials, and you might think that this is low, uh, but I, most millennials have really barely been in their ministry. Uh, if you're a millennial pastor, um, 35 and under, you've not, I don't know, you've not been doing it for too long. Uh, and so to, be, to have this percentage be that high, that low, it, I don't know. I think that's an issue. That 37% of millennials who really have barely started or perhaps even haven't started their ministry, uh, 
For 37% to have considered leaving means that there are issues that need to be addressed. And I think, while I don't, there are a few things that I think lead to this. This is not millennials. Uh, same, exact same statistic. Um, there, as everybody has a different story, I, looking at the data, there were a few trends that I saw. Um, and so we, we're educated. We love our theology. We love our church. The issues that I find to be, uh, there's a thread, we, a few threads weaving through millennial clergy. The first one that I see is we're in debt. Uh, oh, I <laughs> people just got blessed. Praise God. Uh, we're in debt. Um, Question, uh, balancing my, the amount of my education debt with my ministerial salary, current or expected, causes me concern. 72% of millennial clergy are concerned about balancing their school debt with their ministerial salary. Only 17% are not concerned. That means that less than one in five millennial clergy can say they're not concerned about their debt or current, and their current or expected salary. Uh, and this isn't a new issue, according to my data. When you look at non-millennials, it's still over 50% say they're concerned with their education debt. Because the truth is, if you're over 35, if you're between 35 and 50, chances are you're still paying off your school loans. Um, but I think that millennials have it harder than other generations. And I don't, perhaps this is me being the, the typical entitled millennial, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, but I think we have it harder than non-millennials. Uh, education costs have only continued to increase. Uh, so millennials paid more for their education than non-millennials, uh, therefore taking out more debt. And with the rise in education costs, uh, the cost of living is greater today than it has been in the past, yet at the same time, wages have not been increasing. Uh, Ministerial salaries aren't rising at the rate of education or at the rate of the cost of living. This perfect storm makes for a more educated and more in-debt cohort of clergy without anywhere to go. We entered the workforce right as the recession hit, meaning, right as the recession hit. And we're still dealing with that. Uh, jobs are not easy to find in the ministry or outside of the ministry. Uh, we entered the, the workforce, we, we began working, a lot of us entered ministry right as the recession hit. Uh, and what that meant was that older pastors didn't retire. A lot of the older clergy didn't retire from their church because they lost their pensions and benefits, they lost their retirement. Um, and we young clergy need to recognize that, but, but we're still dealing with a struggling economy. Um, and it's my argument, it's my belief that the amount of education debt doesn't only hurt clergy, it does, but it doesn't only affect us, I think it hinders our churches. Many churches can't afford to pay the salary younger clergy need in order to live. Simply put, uh, for young pastors to make it, to balance their debt, it's, it's just... It's seemingly impossible for so many. Um, when millennials get out of school, their monthly school bills hurt them so much. Uh, I've heard clergy who have had to pay up to $900 a month in, in education loans. $900 a month. There are others that pay $300 a month. But let's say that you pay $400 a month on your school loans. You pay $400 a month. This comes out to $4,800 a year. You're paying nearly $5,000 a year as soon as you enter the ministry. Basically, what you have to do is subtract $5,000 from your ministerial salary right away. You're making $5,000 less a year than you would be. This hurts our pastors incredibly, but it hurts our churches. It hurts our churches because they end up being the ones who have to try and compensate for their pastor's debt. They compensate either financially or they compensate pastorally, which is per perhaps worse. They either have to try to increase a salary, and for smaller churches where young clergy are going to go, raising an extra $5,000 a year is, how do you do that? 
They, kind of, they compensate financially or pastorally. Uh, they either have to try to raise the money, which is hardly possible, or, or they can only pay a pastor part-time. Uh, but as we all know, there's no such thing as part-time work in the church. It doesn't exist. Uh, many clergy are hindered from full-time ministry because of their school loans. Many simply cannot do full-time ministry because they have, to, they have to pay off their loans. And this is tragic. It's affecting 72% of us. And lastly, on education debt, I think this is a justice issue. Uh, I think there's a problem with this because with the growing price of education, with the stagnant income levels, undergraduate and graduate degrees will start to favor the rich over the poor more than they already do. Uh, it's a justice issue because the divide be between the haves and the have-nots is only going to increase if the cost of education continues to rise, making it harder and harder for those who do not have to get a theological education. But you pair that with our previous data. We love education. We love our theology. We, we, we want to be educated. We want to be educated clergy to pastor well, but it's so hard when you automatically have to take $5,000 out of your salary right from the start. Here's some quotes. I only work part-time at the church because I can't begin to afford to live and pay off my debts on what the church can afford. I have to have a second job. Not in ministry right now because I can't finish school to get a degree for ministry. This causes my family a great deal of stress. Question was, do you have concern? $80,000 of concern. If you want to get a graduate degree, uh, and if you want to go through a, a, a Nazarene undergrad, undergrad, and then if you want to go to another, if you want to go to a graduate school and continue your education, uh, that's going to be tough. In this eighty thousand dollars of concern, I looked at this person's data specifically. This one, this is someone who hasn't gone to graduate school. This is just from an undergraduate degree. Uh, eighty thousand dollars of debt. What can be done? What, what do we do? We're in debt. What on earth can be done? And this is an incredible question. It really is, and I don't, know, I don't have the answer to it. But I think something has to be done. Uh, perhaps it's too late for millennials. Maybe, maybe the buck has passed for us, but those who are coming behind us, they're going to have it harder than we do. The, the price is just going up, and it's harder and harder. So I don't like to propose things without having some solution. So I have some, I have some thoughts. What can we do? Maybe we can follow NTS's lead. Uh, Dr. Sundberg is doing incredible things to try to make education affordable for her students. The President's Leadership Grant gives one student from each Nazarene University a full tuition for an MDiv plus leadership training. It's an incredible program. Uh, and so there are however many students getting a full MDiv based on that leadership grant. Or endowments. Dr. Sundberg is working on a huge endowment that will give roughly 50 full-time on-site MDiv students full tuition. That's huge. She's working so hard to raise all that money. And that is a great way to try and remedy this issue that's plaguing our generation of clergy. Or maybe we can follow MNU's example, the Ministerial Scholarship Program. Uh, this program is trying to help ministry students so that... Uh, X number of years after ministry, I don't know, maybe Ron, you can tell me, what. however many years after ministry, if they've spent X number of years as pastors in the Church of the Nazarene, their school loans will, will be forgiven or will be covered exponentially. And I had multiple... And then you has that as well? Thank you. Good. Great. So just kind of like cut off the, the first part of the M and you, got, you can kind of... Uh, <laughs> the last part, you can get an N in there. Um, Maybe we could use a modern-day jubilee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we start an institution that would assume clerical debt, assume the debt that clergy have, and charge less interest. Many who went before had a 2% interest rate on their school loans. Do you know what it is today? 6.8. 6.8 interest rate. It has more than tripled. Uh, what if we had an institution that said, you are a pastor... 
we are going to assume your debt and we're going to charge you a 1% or a 2% interest rate on that for 15 or 30 years. That would help us out incredibly. Um, so I don't, again, I don't have a ton of answers, but I wanted to offer something because I, I don't like to bring up problems without trying to solve them in some way. Um, here's the thing, and this is, this is, this is, uh, I think this is so essential. I think we need stronger leadership. Uh, I think, I think millennials need leaders, uh, in big ways. Um, there are a few things under leadership that need to be addressed, and I, I want to talk about three of them really quickly. One of them is we need stronger leadership regarding licensing. When you look, when you look at the data, the, processing, the process of licensing and ordination is an effective and edifying process uh, that encourages young clergy. That looks pretty good. Um, when you look at the data, though, uh, 56% of millennials felt encouraged in their licensing and ordination process. 56% said, yes, I was encouraged and I was edified through my licensing and ordination. 32% felt discouraged by it. To have one third of millennials feel discouraged by their interview process, uh, on top of this excessive debt, that's really hard uh, when you marry those. But what's interesting, look at non-millennials. The same question. It's an it's effective and edifying process that encourages young clergy. Non-millennials think that the process is encouraging and is edifying to young clergy. According to non-millennials, only 14% think it discourages young clergy, while 70% believe it is both encouraging and edifying. This is why I think the millennials need to have a voice. People think it's encouraging and edifying, but it's not nearly as much. And Rick Shule, if you've not read it already, he put together an important story about his move away from the Church of the Nazarene. Um, whether you agree with it or not, you need to read it um, if you haven't already. Uh, we've got to make we've got to find ways to make the licensing process encouraging to applicants. That doesn't mean hard questions shouldn't be asked. That doesn't mean serious inquiries shouldn't be made. But hard questions and probing boards can still be encouraging. We're not afraid to ask to answer hard questions. For too many, the licensing process feels like a hoop that they have to jump through rather than a testing and an empowering system. Rather than being encouraged by those who have gone before and say, I affirm your call. Now I'm going to drill you on it in a loving way. We get, would you prove this to me? You have to, you have to do all these things. So, so what can be done? Uh, well, the answer to that question is also another issue. Stronger leadership with mentoring. The solution to issue number one is another issue in itself. We need mentoring relationships when asked what could make licensing and ordination process be more encouraging and edifying, millennial clergy said over and over again, mentors. We said it all the time. That word appeared more than anything else in that answer. Some of the comments, deeper mentoring relationships, stronger mentoring process, uh, matching candidates with mentors. This needs to be more of a coming alongside of process, closer mentorship and guidance, having more intentional pastoring mentoring, pastoral mentoring. Somebody said, actually have it, have it be encouraging and edifying. Um, <laughs> but mentor, mentors over and over and over again. So another question, I have a clerical mentor who regularly invests in me and my ministry. Over one third, 36% of millennial clergy do not have an invested mentor. And in the conversations I've had, you have to find your own mentor. You have to be proactive about it. Millennial, millennial clergy uh, who need mentors only get them when they take the initiative. Mentors are incredibly important because they allow us to know that we are heard. Uh, and millennials need to know they're being heard. I believe that we have a greater voice now than we have in the past. I do believe that. But millennials, uh, millennials don't believe they have a voice. We don't know that we have a voice in our church. And I, I hesitate to say this, but this was in one of the comments, so I felt like I could. Uh, it can feel like a good old boys club sometimes. Um, in a most literal sense. Um, those who may have some valid and really important criticism uh, most often don't seem to have a place to speak. Uh, in this sense, you have to be good. Uh, without criticism, we, we have a group of yes people. Without criticism, good decisions are harder to come by. Um, without valid critique, decisions are weaker. Um, we don't think we have a voice in our denomination. Uh, sure, we haven't been we haven't put in the time, but it also seems you have to be old. Um, a good old boys club, and then also our delegates seem to be so male. 
Um, feels like a good old boys club. Uh, millennials are the most diverse generation in history, and our de- denominational structures should reflect that, um, especially considering we're the Church of the Nazarene uh, and we are a global church. Um, when it comes to millennials being heard at General Assembly, I believe young Nazarene clergy have a voice at General Assembly. Only 20% of millennials believe they have a voice. 50% do not believe younger clergy have voices. I do not believe that we have a place at the table. Um, maybe that's nothing. Maybe that's nothing new. Uh, perhaps that's just how it's been. But I think young clergy need to know they're heard. Uh, when you look at non-millennials, 39% believe millennial clergy have a voice, with only 29% disagreeing. Uh, that's a big difference. Non-millennials think young people are heard. Young people don't think they're heard. Um, and so then the last thing in regards to leadership um, is we need stronger leaders who won't perpetuate the system. The truth is our world is changing. Yeah, and it's changing faster and in more ways than anyone would have ever thought possible 20 years ago. The, inter- the internet is changing our world in ways we, we can't even anticipate. Uh, We're still dealing with a major recession in the American economic system. Uh, Some argue that the West is on the brink of, if not past the tipping point of a new historical paradigm, something that happens every 500 years or so. We're moving out of, if not already out of, Christendom. You can't assume people know the story. Uh, And at the same time, we we millennials know that generations of faithful, committed followers uh, have spent their lives in service to the Church of the Nazarene, and we don't disregard what has already been built. Uh, as we saw earlier, millennials, we really love our church. We love it. But it appears to us that there have been too many who are working to try to simply keep what we have going. In the midst of these systemic, sociological, and cultural changes, many don't want to let go of what the den- denomination has been or what the den- denomination has looked like in the past. It's, it, it feels to millennials uh, that many leaders are functioning in a mode of self-preservation. Um, and when we live in self-preservation mode, when our aim is to keep what we have going, going, regardless of means, we cease to live sacrificially. Uh, when we're trying to preserve the self, we no longer practice kenosis. Uh, the self, self-preservation is the opposite of the example set by Christ in his self-emptying. When you're trying to preserve the self, kenosis is impossible. The downward mobility of Christ. We need leaders who are visibly okay with not perpetuating the system. We need leaders who are not trying to preserve the self of the institution, who are willing to live sacrificially within certain financial and denominational realities. We really need to to live the kenosis ethic, the way of the cross, because when we can no longer live sacrificially, uh, we lose our mission. And the truth is, millennials may be exactly what the Church of the Nazarene needs. Uh, Millennials aren't concerned with doing something something, something simply for the sake of doing something. Uh, We often get pegged as the authenticity generation, and there is truth in that. uh, But I think it's it's not just being authentic, uh, but it's purpose. Uh, It's not merely about authenticity, it's about purpose. Millennials are a teleological generation. We don't want to do things that have no apparent or significant purpose. And it is my opinion that this is, this is exactly what could end up saving our tribe. Millennials aren't concerned with keeping things Nazarene because we're concerned with living faithfully. That's our primary aim. And in this regard, I believe millennials are a generation who are willing to live out the ethic of kenosis in some really hard and some really real ways because that is what it means to follow Christ. Uh, We pick up our cross as persons and as communities. Millennial clergy should give you strength for today and hope for tomorrow because we're educated. We love our theology. We love our church. We're creative. We're not afraid to fail. For innovation to happen, failure is going to happen, and we need to be permitted to fail. We need to be okay with failing. We're also the hope for the Church of the Nazarene because we're not concerned with preserving the Church of the Nazarene. But there are some major issues that need to be addressed. One major issue is educational debt. The other is that of leadership. Uh, We need stronger leadership with the licensing process. We need stronger leadership with mentoring. And we need stronger leaders who won't perpetuate the system. Um, So, in conclusion, uh, to non-millennials, stop talking about millennials. 
<laughs> and start talking to millennials. Have a conversation with us. We're not afraid of the former generations. We're not apathetic towards former generations. We want to be partners in the conversation, not things to be talked about. Uh, mentor millennial clergy. Seek us out to be mentored because we often don't know where to go. Uh, we younger clergy want mentors who would commit to us, who would help us learn this new role, who would teach us how to balance a church budget. Boy, how do you do that? Um, if you know, please tell me. Um, who will help us learn how to shape a culture. These aren't things, these are things we want to learn. These are things we want those who will walk alongside us and say, hey, that's a good question. And these are things we need to learn. And we need to learn them not just through seminary, but also through relational and disciple, discipling mentorship. We need people to imitate. And then to millennials, reconsider your call. I know that's a big thing. Um, but I'm, are you called to be a lead pastor? Um, it's my assessment that we need more committed, theologically inclined, Holy Spirit convicted young pastors. We need more, not less. Uh, get a broader imagination of what ministry looks like. Many young clergy don't pursue, don't pursue the role of lead pastor because the only pastor they've known was their youth pastor. For many of us, the only relationship we ever had was with our youth pastor. Many college students have never had a meaningful conversation with their lead pastor until they get to college. And so if you are a lead pastor, regardless of generation, do not relegate youth responsibilities only to your youth pastor. If you're a lead pastor, you are a pastor to adults, to senior adults, to youth, and to children, and to college students. Too many young ministry students have a narrow imagination of ministry simply because they never had a lead pastor invest or believe in them. Millennial clergy, think about who invested in you. Who were the ones that believed in you? Are you called to staff pastors because the only person you've ever had invest in your life was a staff pastor? Reconsider your call. Also reconsider your call because change in the denomination comes, I believe, primarily through the pulpit. Um, and while we don't want people pursuing the pulpit simply to try to change the denomination, that is, that is not the aim of being a lead pastor, uh, don't hear that. We do need theologically informed, Holy Spirit convicted women and men in the, of the millennial generation leading our churches, not just from a staff position. We need them leading the churches. Millennials, reconsider your call. Pray and ask God if He calls you to be a lead pastor. Find a loving mentor. If you don't have one already, pursue it. Uh, please stay. Keep pursuing theological education. We need more educa educated clergy, not less. If you don't have a master's degree, pursue a graduate degree. If you already have a master's degree, consider a PhD or a DMIN. Uh, we need more educated clergy, not less. Find ways to get scholarships or pursue NTS with their incredible scholarship opportunities. Uh, the laity will be more educated when our clergy are more educated. Uh, you talk about having uneducated laity. That's because our clergy aren't educating them. Uh, and lastly, please stay. Our denomination needs us, and we need to be committed to the Church of the Nazarene. So please stay and help teach us how to live faithfully in a world that is changing faster than we know. Um, instead of more experts, we need a richer ecclesiology. Instead of more consultants, we need more theologically informed, Holy Spirit convicted, and faithfully committed clergy. Uh, and lastly, I have some final resources if you want to look at those. Uh, these are important books uh, in looking at young leaders and the world in which we live. Um, that's what I have. I'm one minute over. You guys are free to go. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'm going to stick around for a little bit to talk. So uh, thank you.